Let me introduce myself. I'm Carrie Silverstein. Um, I'm a retired graduate professor, a businessman, a writer. I'm eclectic. So, you know, if you say, who are you? My wife always says that to me every day. Who are you? What's going on? <laughs> which, career, which career today? I like, I like unique aspects of Jewish history, and my journey started, believe it or not, with Hadassah magazine. Uh, our family are lifelong Hadassah members and uh, keepers of the gate, right? And so my wife gets the magazine on a snowy Wisconsin, grew from Wisconsin, on a snowy Wisconsin afternoon, which they have been a lot lately. Uh, I had nothing to do, so I picked up the Hadassah magazine. There was no football, no baseball yet. It's that gap between the Super Bowl and spring training. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I picked up the magazine, and there's this little article that said Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. And I said, you gotta be kidding, Jewish pirates in the Caribbean? So I started to read it and it was about a book. It was a book excerpt. So I bought the book. So as I read this book about the Jewish pirates and I did more research on it, and I presented it on a number of times in Wisconsin, that I found that at the end of the lineage of the Jewish pirates, which ends at the beginning of our country, believe it or not, beginning of 1776, the Jewish pirates were no longer pirates, they were privateers, and who did they work for? Us, the colonialists, because we were fighting the British, and then we're not too thrilled with the British. So uh, that was our navy. <coughs> it was a bunch of privateers, and they were Jewish pirates. And after the war was over, they retired. But what happened was a lot of these conversos, and a lot of the Spanish conversos who were conquistadores, and you'll see when we talk about it, ended up in northern Mexico, and when we got into the war with Mexico in the 1800s and took over New Mexico, took over Arizona, they were here. And that's our first Jewish cowboys, were the old conquistadores. They were also in California. They were wherever the Spanish were, Florida, that's where the, the first Jewish Jews were in this country. So as we go through, you can have a, a few what I call aha moments as I had when I was reading it and doing my research, and I spoke to a number of other professors. My wife and I and our families support the study, the uh, Center for Jewish Learning at UWM campus in Milwaukee. So through that, I had a lot of connections with professors across the country who had done little bits. So I took a lot of the little bits and filled in the cracks with my stuff, and that's the presentation that you'll see today. I didn't believe how many books that I bought that were just about Jewish pioneers. Jewish cowboys. I was explaining to the lady up front here that one of the books was Mein Zeta was a Jewish cowboy, and it was written in Yiddish, translated to English. Okay, so these are stories that he would tell his grandchildren about his travels as a Jewish cowboy. So what, you're going to see a lot of that in here. We talked about the conquistadores. They were the first ones. And a lot of people in the Spanish military, navy, were Jews. They, and you'll see this in the pirates, I'm repeating myself for those who don't attend that one. They were the navigators, the astronomers, the cartographers. They were the map makers. And uh, a lot of the captains protected them because if they would leave, they would be without the p main people they needed. And Christopher Columbus, the interesting thing about the Alhambra decree, it was decreed the day that Christopher Columbus set sail for the United States, for uh, North America. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have heard stories in my life that Columbus stemmed from Jews. Yes, he did. Yeah, so and, and if you stay for the second one, you'll see more about that. So what happened was, you had all these Jews in the Navy, all these Jews in the Army, and a lot of the, they were protected by a lot of the non-Jews because they didn't want to lose these people. So they protected them. And in fact, the person who got the money for Columbus to sail to the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere was the treasurer, he was, a, he was a, a, a closeted Jew and had convinced Queen Isabella to give Columbus the money. So all, you learn all these little stories. There are the American Indians, when they were put on the reservations, many Jewish traders were on those reservations selling them clothing, selling them other items, uh, stuff for farming, and many of them worked for the federal government, as you'll see, as administrators for them. And in fact, we're going to get to an aha moment shortly. Fred Harvey, we'll talk about him. This I didn't know about. This to me was a total new piece of information. 
Because you remember the movie The Harvey Girls with Judy Garland? Yeah. Fred Harvey was Jewish. Fred Harvey owned all of the restaurants along the Santa Fe Railroad that served food, and that's how he built his empire. But the first Jewish Californians were the conversos, they, and they, what happened here was when the Jews came to the Northern Hemisphere with the pirates, a lot of them gave up being pirates, and they went into Argentina, they went into Colombia, Venezuela, and they started the sugarcane plantations. And the pirates brought a proth, black slaves from Africa for them to run these plantations, to work the plantations for native uh, labor. The Spanish, when they found out through traders that Jews were living in South America, they sent the Inquisition to South America. And the Inquisition worked its way up from, from Argentina through Colombia and Venezuela and Central America through Mexico over the years, and these Jews constantly were moving to get away from the Inquisition. Many of them stayed and died, others moved. And as they got to northern Mexico, that's how they were here when the United States annexed that property from Mexico after the Mexican War. So they were already getting away and hiding up in northern Mexico, which became southern United States. So that's how they got here. So 1864, 1684 is basically the beginning of the Jewish history of the, of the United States. Did you have a question, ma'am? Yeah, the conversos, weren't they also, was that the name that were given to the Jews that had to hide with, with the Inquisition that they actually had to become Catholics and a lot of, a lot of that history has been lost? Right. Right. But they, but they were given other names: Moranos, Conversos. Know, Moranos. They, Moranos, yeah. And so it's very. They, they use Converso. Converso. Yeah. yeah. Crypto Jews, as we say here. And you're right. They found out. Uh, we went to a lecture through uh, UWM where they found out that there were plenty of Hispanic Jews practicing Shabbos candles and practicing right. other right. things, but not knowing why. Right. It's only because my grandmother did it. So that's why we do it. And those were the Jewish yeah. festivals that they kept. Yes, ma'am? That reminds me that I had a neighbor, and uh, she had candles up. And uh, I asked her, but you are not Jewish? She says, I don't know why I have it up, but my family history was that we have candles up. Again, so there like was tradition. It was so tradition, yes. but they didn't understand why they had right. the tradition. Yeah. And there's been a movement to educate these Jews into Judaism yes. again, bring them back so they can understand why they do what they do. So they settled along in Nuevo Leon on the Salado River region in Mexico. And it's the statement among the Jews was to go north is to die, and space itself is our jail. So rather than stay for the Inquisition, they were going to take their chances going up north and trying to survive. Um, you know that a lot of the animals that are indigenous to the United States were brought here by the Spaniards on their ships. That's how they had food. So the wild pigs that we have here, the ones, the javelinas that everybody hates, and javelina in Spanish means javelin, which is the, the kind of fur they have, that they came on their boats and that they would keep them alive on the boats until they wanted to harvest them and then they had food for the sailors and the soldiers. So they, were, they brought in cat, sheep and cattle to the southwest that were not there before. Okay. And New Mexico territory, as I said earlier, in 1848, that became officially uh, a territory of the United States. Um, I haven't heard this word in a long time. The merchants were called drummers. Remember that old term, that a drummer? Not a guy in a band, but a person who was selling goods, dry goods, peace goods. Um, they went across the states. Now, the thing, this is one of my aha moments. A set of tefillin were found among the Pawnee Indians in 1852. Okay? Did he too? Maybe it wasn't, he didn't find it on Shabbos, he found it on Sunday. The, 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 fact, the fact is, they had tefillin. And uh, you know, those are, those are very, 1852, which meant somebody of our religion was there. Or they went to the store and they thought they looked cute and they were going to buy them. I, don't know. I would think more so the first one. Julius Mayer was an Indian trader in Omaha City, Nebraska. 
He spoke a half a dozen Native American languages. They're all different. There's not, you know, if you speak Apache, you don't speak Pawnee. I mean, they're, they're just they're different languages. This guy was, must have been brilliant. He was an interpreter for the U.S. government, and this is a picture of him with a full blood Pawnee Indian with him. Julius Mayer was called by the Pawnees Babka Risha Hashtaka. That was longer than his Hebrew name, okay? And that means curly white haired chief who speaks one tongue. <laughs> In New Mexico, the Bebo brothers, em Emil, Nathan, and Solomon, were close friends of the Indians, and they were traders, and Solomon became the governor of the Acoma Pueblo, and he was fluent in their language. So he became a governor over the Indians. One of the questions I asked myself was why, excuse the question, why the hell did they go out and do this, right? What motivated them? I mean, yeah, they said, go west, young man. But this was desolate. This, there was nothing here. Why? Why go there? There's nobody to talk to to really find out, but I was just curious. What's the motivation? By education, I'm a psychologist, a behavioral psychologist. So I had to ask that question. What's the motivation to schlep out west? Well, they can be the, in the forefront of establishing whatever, whatever they wanted. There's no Catholics. Really. What? There's no Catholics. There's no Catholics. <laughs> There's no synagogues. You'll see when the first synagogue was built. You know, what, what happened, of course, is the Jews who came in from, from South America and wound up in New Amsterdam, and when, when that got big, and, and the whole eastern seaboard got big, they kept moving west to establish businesses. And, when, and they were all, by nature, either peddlers or... But they followed the railroad, is what they did. They followed whatever they followed. They, they got out here because they wanted more opportunity. But Norman, you're going to see as we go forward, I grew up in New York City. If you can't hear the accent, then um, you know, you're deaf. <laughs> I grew up in New York City for 33 years, and I thought Ellis Island was the only way people came into the United States. Not true. You'll see that more Jews, possibly more Jews came in through Galveston than any other place. Yeah, that was because the German Jews in New York didn't want the Eastern European Jews to come in. It's the French, Alsace-Lorraine, parts of Germany, they came in through Galveston. And what happens is when you come through successfully, you write your fr friends and family and say, this is the way to come. So over 100,000 Jews came through Galveston, Texas. Okay, amazing. Um, in fact, Galveston was the biggest, biggest, biggest city in Texas at that time because of that. Salma Bebo, he was born in Prussia in 1853, 1869. He followed his two brothers to America. Does anybody know why those dates are important? the 1850s and the 1860s. Well, yeah, the well, this is Prussia. This is not Russia. Then no. I don't know. Okay. The Germany at that time was going through consolidation. And they were trying to build the Germany. There were a lot of little duchies and things like that. And whoever was in charge, I can't think of the, the name of, of, of the head of Germany at that time, the prince. The, the, it wasn't a king. It was something else. He decided that he was Kaiser. going uh, Kaiser. The Kaiser decided that he was going to consolidate the German states. And obviously it affected I'm the sure Jews, and the Jews said, goodbye, you know, we're leaving. We're going to Yenemveld. We don't know where it is, but we're going to America. Uh, he came to the Pueblo in 1882 to set up a trading post. He married an Acoma woman, Ju Juana Valley, in 1885, and the Beebles had extensive sheep raising operations in New Mexico. Yes. My grandparents were born in Germany in 18... 56, and uh, why they didn't have much land and so on. The Jews were not allowed to, 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 to have land. To own anything. They, to own anything, so they started businesses. We, my grandparents started a, uh, a grocery, so to speak. Anything to make a living. Right. Okay. He was elected governor of the Pueblo in 1885. He supervised the installation of the first uh, school teacher at his home, and his family left in 1898. So he did a lot of good things for the, the Pueblo. 1860s, there were many Jews doing business with the Indians in Arizona. Herman and Joseph Levi had traded with the Apaches, the Spiegelberg, and Gunsfield families did business with the Navajos in New Mexico. 
So they were coming out to trade. They, were, they had businesses established. 1864, Sigmund Schlesinger arrived in America from Hungary, 14 years old. He went from New York to Leavenworth, Kansas, became a merchant clerk, found his way to Fort Hayes as a scout, and was involved in the Battle of Arikara Fork. This is a very famous Jew. Came here in, at 14 years old. I was only allowed to take the subway into Manhattan when I was 14 years old and come back, okay? He came here. Your grandfather, my wife's grandfather, came here at 13 from, from uh, Austria. In, seven, in, in September of 1868, he was uh, a scout and he was awakened by somebody shouting Indians. During the second wave, he was confronted by this, this Indian, Roman Nose, the Cheyenne Indian leader. He and other scouts were rescued and he was not recognized for his bravery, bravery excuse me, until August of 1893. So somebody wrote a poem about him. When the foe charged on the breastworks with madness and despair, and the bravest souls were tested, the little Jew was there. <laughs> when the weary dozen on duty and the wounded needed care, when another shot was called for, the little Jew was there. With the festering dead around them, shedding poison in the air, when the crippled chief in order, the little Jew was there. And the author was General James D. Fry, 1893. And he was awarded a medal, but it took that long a time for him to get it. We had a first Jewish gunslinger. Did you ever think about that? A Jewish gunslinger. Where was he from? Ireland. Ireland. <laughs> Irish Jew, 1842. Um, he came with his parents as a young boy, and his first job was a miner in Pioche, Nevada. Okay? Levy traveled the West extensively. He was involved in many gunfights. He shot and killed many men. In 1882, he was ambushed outside the fashion saloon in Tucson after an argument with John Murphy. He was 40 years old. He was friends with Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. But he was such a good shot that they had to ambush him, or they called him in those days, bushwhacked him. Wyatt Earp was married to That's coming up. <laughs> Do you know what her profession was? She was a That's right. She was in management. Let's get that right. <laughs> 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 That's good. She was in hospitality management. <laughs> very hospitable. <laughs> in one of the books, there was a very suggestive picture of her. I couldn't believe it. it was a tintype taken in the 1800s of her, and she was wearing something very sheer. And it was like, what the hell is this doing in the middle of the book with all the cowboys? <laughs> White Earp's wife. Another one, Henry Castro from France. So what do we have? We have Jews from where? Austria, Dublin, France, Germany, right? Uh, he was a French diplomat of Portuguese Jewish descent. Uh, he immigrated to the United States and became an American citizen in 1827. He was a banker in France and sought to secure a loan for the Young Republic of Texas. He was appointed general counsel for the Texas by somebody we all know, Sam Houston, okay? So another, a French Jew. He recruited hundreds of families to immigrate in Texas. These are where, excuse me, the Jews came through Galveston from France because of him. You know, let us go up and back. I'm here. Come join me. Uh, they traveled to Texas from 1843 to 1847, settled in Medina River Valley, San Antonio. Castroville on the Medina River is named for him, as in Castro County in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, my Mahatunum lived in San Antonio in Castro County, so I knew that name. Galveston. By 1838, Jews were already in Galveston. By 1870, it was the biggest city, I said, in Texas. Jews arriving from Alsace through Galveston instead of New York and other eastern cities. They were aided by the Jewish Immigration Information Bureau and Rabbi Henry Cohen. And this is his temple, Temple Beth Jacob, still standing. Still there. Is it still a cemetery? It's yeah. And the amazing thing is that it, it, the, the, at that time already there was a Jewish Im Im Information Immigrants Bureau to help these people when they came to Galveston. Rabbi Henry Cohen, uh, he has a community house over there, and the and first B'nai Israel Temple is, is on the right. So very much uh, established in Galveston. 
because of B'nai Israel and the Jewish community in Galveston was forever changed by Rabbi Henry Cohen when he arrived in 1888, educated in England, so he has an Englishman coming in, arrived in the United States in 1885, and he put his stamp on B'nai Israel and the larger community in the 64 years he lived in Galveston. He was the Jew Jewish leader for 64 years in Galveston, Texas. This is what he said in his letters to his friends, and, and this is from his writings. All Western states' climates is warm and good, living is moderate, cheaper than New York, already then, all right? <laughs> Wages are much higher than New York. Population is very intelligent and friendly towards Jews, okay? And in 1930, the New York Times recognized Rabbi Cohen as the, one of the 10 foremost religious leaders in the United States. And what year did he write that? I, I wish I could tell you. I, I could research it, but I don't remember. I think that had to be in the in late 1800s, early 1900s, when the immigration was taking place. Now, in 1907, Jacob H. Schiff, a banker, established a goal of bringing a quarter of a million Jews from Eastern Europe in through Galveston. And the population of the Western states are the result of this project. As I said, New Mexico Jews, Arizona Jews, Texas Jews, California Jews, all through Galveston. His efforts with, along with the House of, of those of the Jewish Territorial Organization and those of Rabbi Cohen were instrumental in supporting this effort. So this is what a Polish immigration family, immigrant family that came in through <coughs> uh, Galveston. Another famous Jew was Nathan Benjamin Appel, Germany, 1928. He was a teenager when he came here. He went to St. Louis and rode the Santa Fe trail to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and on to Socorro, Mexico. He moved his family and dealings as Apaches in the Civil War permitted. Uh, he was a delegate to the first Arizona Territorial Le Legislature. He was the Tucson police chief, <coughs> Jewish police chief, in 1883 to 1884. He then moved to Los Angeles, where he became a popular court bailiff. What is that? Well, people like dealing with him. He was popular. You know, the bailiff helps you decide, God bless you, if the judge is going to hear your case. And in those days, there's probably a lot of lobbying with the person, I want the judge to hear my case. We'll see if we can get you into the calendar. Now, this gentleman was not a cowboy, but I want to hear you say what he did for a living. A Dario Rio typist. A photographer. But in those days, it was called a daryotype, not a, not a photograph, because it was on metal. And the guy who invented it was his name, the Dario, the Dario or whatever. Right, he was French. Yeah. Right. So he was born in South Carolina in 1815. He was a portrait painter, a photographer, an expeditionary artist. He went with John C. Fremont on his fifth expedition from Missouri to Utah. So he traveled the northern west and taking pictures and uh, images of what was going on. He was also, he was Jew, Jewish, but with that name, he was a Spanish Jew. He went on a peace mission with Brigham Young in central Utah, where he painted portraits of Native American leaders. His photographs were basis of adventures in the far west in 1857. He died in New York in 1897. One of the things that comes out from this and other books is that the Mormons were very friendly to the Jews. And a lot of the Jews traveled on Mormon wagon trains out to the West. Fred Harvey, I mentioned that earlier. He came from England also when he was 17. And he started in the hospitality business as a pot scrubber in a New York restaurant. How much lower can you start, right? A dishwasher, that's where he started. He started in the kitchen. After the Civil War, he ascended to the corporate ladder at the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. Eventually, he was transferred to Leavenworth, Kansas. What's Leavenworth, Kansas famous for? Prison. Which prison? Military. Federal military prison. Right. You don't want to go to Leavenworth. I mean, the city, okay, but you don't want to get a reservation there. Uh, this is Judy Garland in the movie The Harvey Girls. Uh, in 1873, he and a partner set up three restaurants along the Kansas Pacific Railroad. In 1876, their partnership failed. Then he associated himself with the Santa Fe Railroad. He had 84 restaurants at one time. Okay, forget about McDonald's and Burger King. 
84 Harvey restaurants along the railroad. And the Harvey girls were introduced to the restaurants and boosted sales. So these are the first, which girls? The first, no, Hooters. These, but these, these Hooters, were, these ladies were covered up. <laughs> Naive girls, yeah. right. Yeah. These people worked with Fred Harvey, Dave Benjamin and Herbert Schweitzer, uh, and they were the first prominent Jews to do business all over the United States of the West. It wasn't the United States yet, it was still the United the Uniting States, because one by one states were getting what? Statehood. They were filing for statehood. Dr. Herman Bentel. He was born in Albany, New York in 1843, he was a surgeon in the Civil War. He was the Arizona Superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1870. He visited the tribes to discuss their needs. He served in this position until 1873. So he was the, the chief guy when it came to the Native Americans in, this, in Arizona. Not the state of Arizona, the territory of Arizona. He was quite controversial in both the Jewish and Catholic communities. He was opposed by the paper in Boston called The Pilot and even the Jewish Times. He returned in 1873 to Albany, married his sweetheart Wilhelmine Louis. Louis. Shortly afterwards, he served as the U.S. Consul to Denmark. So he got himself up in the, in the government, didn't he? To be appointed to be an ambassador. Nathan Leo was a French immigrant who moved to Oak New Mexico with his family and built a store in 1906 after he rode the range in Texas, just like the other gentleman. He was a major purchaser of local sheep, wool, cattle, hides, and grain. He was the postmaster in the Notary Public. Do you remember Notary Publics? That red sign outside, the drugstores and everything else, that you needed something notarized, you went in and you paid for that. Okay? We still have them, they're in banks now. They're in ba yeah, bank offices, yeah. right, and lawyers. His store served as the region's political and social center, he developed a large sheep and cattle operations, and in 1938, he closed the store and devoted his time to ranching interests. This family still exists in New Mexico, and they still own the ranches. The first Jewish wedding in Arizona took place in 1879 in the home of Mrs. Solomon of Tucson. The bride was Lily Marks and Joseph Goldtree, an early Arizona settler. So the first chasana in Arizona was 1879. This was the book that was translated from Hebrew, okay? Meyer Ben Yisakil becomes Mike Benson. That happened to how many families when they came in through Ellis Island or Galveston, right? The guy, when I read the book, the guy at the thing says, nah, you're Mike Benson. He says, I want to give you an American name. So he said, okay, he's Mike Benson. Uh, in 1912. He met Isaac Weiss from the Jewish Information and Immigration Bureau and starts his transition to being an American cowboy. He gets his first mm -hmm. pair of Levy blue jeans and a job at a ranch in Texas. When you read this section of the book, he's coming off wearing a yarmulke. He has sitsis on, everything else. He comes across and he's met by somebody and they say, we, we need to take you shopping. And they take him into a Western store. And they get him Levi's, they get him a vest, they get him a shirt, they get him a hat, a and boots. And there was a job waiting for him at the ranch, which they had a job already. And what, the ranch wasn't owned by a Jew. It was, it was a goy that owned the restaurant, they rent the ranch, but they got him a job at the ranch. He had a job already. He goes on his first cattle drive from Texas to Kansas and experiences branding of cattle, eating from a chuck wagon, and sleeping around a fire. He learns both English and Spanish from his fellow cowboys. Okay? He didn't speak any English when he came here. <coughs> he finally goes to Kansas City and goes to a public bath to remove the dirt from the cattle drive. He goes to Sandusky Street and finds a Jewish neighborhood and a kosher meal at Abe Hirschfeld's home. Meets his future wife, Selma. The rest is history. What happens is he goes to Sandusky Street, he's wandering around, and he stops this man, and he says, where can I get a kosher meal? And the guy says, where are you from? And he tells him the whole thing, because he's speaking Yiddish. He says, he says, come with me, it's Shabbos, you come to my house, you have dinner, you meet my family, 
and he's telling the story is being recounted to his oh, grandchildren. And he says, this was your grandmother. So those are today's Jewish cowboys. <laughs>